Welcome to the Exit Rich Podcast, where the leading authority on buying, selling, fixing, and growing companies, Michelle Seiler Tucker, is dedicated to helping you find the path to retire rich and move on to your next adventure by exiting your business for the desired dream price you deserve. Get ready to exit rich with your host, Michelle Seiler Tucker. And I'm here with two special guests, a father and son team. I have never had a father and son team on the show today. So this is going to be fun. Fasten your seatbelts, get ready for the ride of your life because we're going to talk about something very interesting. We're going to talk about the new law. You know, the government loves to come up with new laws and then like to be quiet about it. <laughs> they love to come up with these laws and then it's shush. So we can't follow them and then they can penalize us and make us pay a lot of money. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, the law that nobody's talking about. So pay attention, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Exit Rich. So let's get started with my guest, Garrett Sutton, the father. Raise your hand, Garrett. <laughs> is a corporate attorney, asset protection expert, and best-selling author. He has sold more than a million books, a million, y'all, to guide entrepreneurs and investors. For more than 30 years, Garrett Sutton has run, you know what I know what New Orleans people are thinking about? Does he own the jewelry store called Sutton's Jewelry? <laughs> but no, he doesn't, folks. Um, he has run his practice assisting entrepreneurs and real estate investors in protecting their assets. The companies he founded, Corporate Direct and Sutton Law Center, currently help, they've helped more than 13,000 or they're still helping more than 13,000 clients protect their assets and incorporate their business. Garrett also serves as a member of the elite group of Rich Dad Advisors. You remember Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the book for best-selling author Robert Kiyosaki. A number of the books Garrett Sutton has authored are part of the best-selling Rich Dad Wealth Building book series. He's written 12 books. That's a lot. Additionally, he has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Credit.com, and other publications. Garrett has been recognized as a Lifetime Achievement Member of America's Top 100 Attorneys. So Ted, his son, had quite the long bio too, but I had to shorten that a little bit because <laughs> we want to get into talking about the law. So Ted Sutton graduated law school in May 2022, and guess what? He passed the bar the very first time. So congrats, Ted. Welcome Thank to the you. show, Garrett and Ted. We're happy to have you on. Thanks, Michelle. Great to be with you. Yeah, so thanks, we, Michelle. You're welcome. So before we dive into the law, let's dive into the two of you. <laughs> let's talk about a brief snapshot. And I want to spend a whole lot of time here because I really want to give everybody these golden nuggets and bring people up to speed of what's happening, what's going to be happening in 2024. So tell me a little bit, father and son. Um, I know you went in a different direction, Ted. You were an electrical engineer, I believe. And then you decided to go to law school. Now the two of you are working together. Uh, how's that working out for the both of you? Yeah, so you pretty much covered the whole thing. Um, <laughs> I was in mining engineering in college. I worked at a mine in Chile before I graduated. Had a great time, but realized that it wasn't necessarily the career path that I wanted. So um, I graduated and, you know, with a little bit of advice from this guy right here, um, your father, and, your mentor, your, yep. My he gave you life. Father. He gave you life. <laughs> real. You know, thanks dad. You're welcome. Um, yeah. So I made the decision to go to law school, graduated last year, passed two bar exams. And, um, uh, now I'm just working underneath him, having a good time. Not just working underneath him. You're Working. working. I, I don't like when somebody says, I'm just a real estate agent. I'm just an attorney. Now you guys are changing the world. Come on. So let's dive into it. Let's talk about the law. Garrett, what's this new law that nobody's talking about? Well, Michelle, it's really surprising that no one's talking about it because it affects 38 million businesses in the United States. Everybody without, with only a few exceptions is subject to this new reporting requirement whereby you have to provide the U.S. Treasury Department with information about who owns 25% or more of the company, who has control of the company. And if you fit, and most people do, you have to provide your personal information, a copy of your driver's license or passport, 
Uh, if you change ownership in the company, you need to update that with the U.S. Treasury Department. This is a big law that affects a lot of people and no one is talking about it. Uh, it starts so, January 1st and everybody's going to be subject to it. So January 1st, nobody's talking about it. Um, I've talked to a lot of people since we spoke yesterday and nobody's heard about it. I own multiple companies. I haven't heard about it. My partners haven't heard about it. My clients haven't heard about it. You know, why is that? Why is nobody talking about it? Well, I think part of it is people just hope that it would be rescinded. You know, they, they just thought that the government can't possibly uh, have this database with all this personal information. You know, all these databases get hacked and this is going to be a target rich database. You know, people are going to be trying to hack into this one uh, right from the start. And so people kind of assumed that the government would come to realize that really we don't need this database. We don't need this law. But you know, out of Washington, they're saying, look, this law is coming. You better get ready for it because if you mm -hmm. don't file. Now you, you have to file the information, but there's no uh, dollar amount you have to include. So it's just filing information. You don't have to pay anything. But if you don't file, Michelle, uh, they can penalize you up to $10,000. And if you're willfully not filing, they can send you to jail for two years. And you know that they're going to make examples of people, you know, that guy up in the Idaho Hills who does not want to file anything with the government. They're going to make an example of people who willfully fail to file and they're going to send them to prison as an example to everyone else. Mm -hmm. So what's the motivation here? What, what, what's behind this, this act? this transparency act. What is it because people are avoiding paying taxes? Is it money laundering? What it's is money it? laundering and terrorist financing? So the idea is that by having this database of everybody's ownership information and substantial control information, uh, the I, I mean, the uh, treasury department will be able to more efficiently, uh, be able to understand money laundering and terrorist financing. And many nations have this kind of law in effect. The U.S. is one of the last countries to have such a law. Mm -hmm. But the thing to realize is the bad guys are, are not going to tell the truth. I mean, the bad guys are just going to. They're not. They're just gonna do, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. So the other 38 million uh, business owners have to file their information. Uh, so. It, it's quite an onerous uh, law and, you know, we don't know. I don't know enough about the intelligence uh, systems in the United States if this is going to allow them to catch people. Now, once you file that information, the IRS, the CIA, Interpol, all sorts of people uh, investigating uh, money laundering and terrorist financing crimes, those organizations will have access to this database. So that's the whole idea is to allow these super in law enforcement agencies, the FBI and the CIA to have access mm -hmm. to this information. Will it work? I don't know. But in the meantime, again, no one's talking about this. And this is something that is coming January 1st. If you have an entity already in existence, uh, you know, 2023, you set up an entity, you have to file this information uh, within the first year. So January 1st to December 31st of 2024, you have to file this information or you're in violation. And you have to file it as of that date, just to clarify. Yeah. So it, Go ahead, Ted. Oh, yeah. it depends on when your business is formed. So if your business is formed before January 1st, 2024, so th these are all the businesses that you have set up right now all the ones that dad has set up right now. Um, you know, anyone out, else out there watching that has a business right now. If it's set up before January 1st, 2024, you have an entire year to report this information to the, de to the Department of the Treasury. So if you already have it- So we have a year. We don't have to do it by January 1st, 2024. Right. Yeah. But we have to do it by December 31st of 2024. Yes. And then- okay. It changes if you form your business after January 1st, 2024. If you form it after that date, 
then you only have 30 days to report this information to um, FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes and Enforcement Network at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. So if you already have a business set up right now, they're going to give you a little bit more of a grace period. But if you set up a business after January 1st, the clock really starts ticking on you. So attention, all listeners, <laughs> set up that business now. <laughs> Go get your LLC and your operating agreement and all your paperwork. I'll get, get all your ducks in a row now. You know, reach out to Garrett and Ted so you can get all that lined up. I have about two to three more businesses I'm starting and I was going to wait till 2024. Well, guess what? I'm going to do that now. Why would I wait? Right? <laughs> well, I think that's a good idea, Michelle, because it's going to take a while for the, the government to get all this fit, worked out. And so to have that period of time, that extra year to file, uh, I think makes sense. Yeah. So we're not pushing a panic button here, listeners. We're not pushing a panic button. We're just educating you to let you know if you're about to start a business, start it this year. And if you've been in business, make sure you file uh, December 31st or before of, of 2024. Now, the criminals are not going to tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. So how is this going to, how, how is this going to work? How, how is this going to happen? They're, and they're putting all the onus on us. And, you know, as business people are going to do what we need to do because nobody wants to pay a $10,000 fine or end up in jail uh, for not reporting something. So, how is this going to change anything? That's a really good question. Um, you know, the, the criminals are going to use nominees. Uh, they're going to uh, maybe use unincorporated associations. I mean, you could be a sole proprietor. You could be a general partnership and you don't have to file under this. So good question. So wait a minute. Let's back that up because you just said something very important. So let's back that train up. So if you're a general, let's talk about the, the different corporations and who has to file, who doesn't have to file. Yeah. So for this law, for the new Corporate Transparency Act, um, the entities that have to file are anything, um, any entity that's filed by filing a document with the Secretary of State. So, so a partnership has to file? Yeah, if it's a limited a partnership, limited partnership, it partnership does. But a limited partnership, partnership, you don't file with the state, so you wouldn't have to file with FinCEN. Which partnerships? General partnership. General partnership, you don't have to do. Right. A general partnership, though, offers zero asset protection. So I'd rather see you file than operate as a general partnership. Agreed. And we are going to, just so you all know, we're going to have them back on the show Ted and, and Garrett, um, we're going to have them back on the show to discuss asset protection because we have a lot right here to discuss. And, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? <laughs> so let's get past this law and then we'll get to, into asset protection. All right. So what about sole proprietorships? Don't have to file. So sole proprietorships, general partnerships don't have to file. Partnerships, LLCs, S corps, C corps, everything else has to file, correct? correct? Yeah. Including some uh, homeowner associations. Uh, if you have an oh. HOA, uh, there is a requirement for the HOA to file. Okay, good to know. Um, anything else in real estate that that real estate investors, real estate? Uh, business owners, anything that they have to file? I mean, again, you go back to the corporation, right? Yeah. Well, most people are going to hold their real estate in an LLC, in some cases an LP, uh, but an LLC, uh, you know, you could have 10 owners, each owning 10% of that LLC. So you don't have to file the, sh the members names because they don't own 25% or more, but someone in that LLC, one or more people, have substantial control. They're the manager. They make the decisions. And if you're uh, a decision maker like that, if you're a manager of an LLC, despite what the ownership is, you still have to file as a manager of the LLC. So this, this hits every LLC that's owning real estate. Okay. So let's, let's, um, my team in the show comments, let's put in the show comments there. If, if you're a sole proprietor, or, or a journal partnership, you don't have to file. However, you do need to call Garrett and Ted <laughs> so they can protect your assets because you might lose everything. And then, all right, let's back up on that real quick, Garrett. So 
Talk about the partnerships and percentages one more time to make sure we're crystal clear on that. Right. So the requirement is for shareholders or members, owners of an entity, if you own 25% or more, you have to provide that information to FinCEN. So let's say- So 25% or more, I'm going to break it down here. Let's get that in the show comments, my team. If you own 25% or more, you have to report that to who? FINRA. And, uh, the U.S. Treasury Department. U.S. Treasury Department. U.S. Treasury Department. So an example, Go ahead. you have an, an LLC that has a 40% owner, a 30% owner, and two 15% owners, right? You've got four uh -huh. owners. Two of them are above the 25% threshold. You have to report the information on the two that own greater than 25%. The two that each own 15%, you don't have to report on them. So you don't have to file on the minorities that under 25%. Yeah. Yeah. And there's actually uh, two prongs to that requirement. So um, the first is if you own 25%. But the second one is if you exercise substantial control over the entity. So it's either or. Um, so you can either own 25% or more, or you can exercise substantial control over the business. So going back to the example that dad said, if those two 15% owners were managers of right. that LLC, then because they're managers, they would exercise substantial control over the business. And so they would have to report their information to FinCEN. So, you know, they're just trying to encompass as much as they possibly can. Uh, and they just want to gather as much information as possible. So how do we protect ourselves from a security standpoint? Because like you said earlier, Garrett, the likelihood of, of this database being hacked is pretty likely. <laughs> and so where's our protection? Well, the, the U.S. government, when they came out with this information, said, you know, we are going to uh, not let anyone hack into this. And if anyone hacks into it, it's five years in prison. Well, Michelle, when do hackers ever get caught? I mean, have you ever heard an example of the hackers from other countries ever being brought to justice? It just never happens. So I think it should be reversed, Gat. I think if we get hacked, Government should spend five years in prison. <laughs> Wouldn't well, that be nice? You have, you have plenty of people that would agree with that, Michelle. Um, so, now, I probably better zip yeah. it so I don't get in trouble. Right. right. <laughs> but the, the thing is that this database is going to be uh, a, just a big target because there is all sorts of sensitive information uh, on this database. And so, you know, as a U.S. citizen, now, if you're a foreign uh, business owner and you qualify to do business in the U.S. So you have a Swiss company that's registered in Switzerland, but you qualify to do business in the state of New York, you still have to file. So it applies to foreign companies doing business in the U.S. as well. Uh, but, How are they going to catch them? <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, I guess. Are you going to get on a plane and arrest them? <laughs> yeah. I guess they'll file against their entity here. Yeah, they're going to uh, cross check with the IRS. So if that Swiss company is filing a tax return uh, within yeah. the U.S., uh, the FinCEN guys are going to cross check with the IRS and see if you've made the filing. So, what about the business owners out there that never file? <laughs> They're making money, they're cash, they never file. They might be a legit, well, I don't know if you call them legit if they're not filing their taxes, but they never file. How, how are they even going to catch them? Well, they haven't caught them for not paying their taxes. So how are they going to catch them for not filing the exactly. report? I, I agree with you. Um, Is this under the Biden administration? Actually, it's really interesting. It was, uh, it was uh, brought as part of the budget under the Trump administration in 2020, the closing days of his administration, Trump vetoed the bill. He didn't like this corporate transparency act and the Congress overrode his veto uh, because they needed the budget, not because they were especially interested in the CTA, uh, but it was vetoed by Trump. Uh, and that led some people to believe that the Republicans would overturn it, but it hasn't happened. 
Understood. So it could get overturned, though, with this next election coming up, perhaps. It could. But, you know, there's this element in Washington where both sides of the aisle, they, they want more information and more control over us. And uh, so I, I don't know. I, our, our situation is this is the law. We have to help our clients follow it. And so we're getting ready to do so. If they if they yeah. change it, fine. But, you know, our job as lawyers is to help our clients get through this. So everyone listen to, to, to Garrett and Ted. Don't listen to me. <laughs> All right. So Ed asks, how might it affect the U.S. in terms uh, where did it go? Oh, just my question disappeared on me. OK, so Ed asks, how might it affect the U.S. in terms of its standing in global business and finance? Well, I think that uh, most other countries have these kind of rules and, you know, you can make money in the U.S. And so I, I don't I don't see it having that big of an effect on international business. Uh, I will say, though, to your point, I've had two clients that were based in foreign countries operating in the U.S. And because of this new law, they stopped operating in the U.S. So it will have some effect. OK. Steph asks, how does the act contribute to the border efforts to combat money laundering, terrorism, financing, and other financial crimes? Um, well, I mean, I, I would think that uh, it would allow the, um, the FBI and the CIA to find out information about, uh, you know, money laundering efforts. Um, Will people tell the truth, though? I, I don't know how effective it's going to be because, you know, the bad guys are just not going to tell the truth. So it's an open question whether this will be successful or not. I mean, it doesn't sound like it so far, but who knows, right? We'll see. I don't know. All right. So I guess Steph's on a row because he's asking a bunch of questions here. How does, um, let's see. How does the act require businesses to disclose their ben their beneficial ownership information and what is the inspected impact of this? Also, before we answer, if my team is listening, I need these comments and the, these comments we said in the notes, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And St uh, Stefan asked a really good question here. So there's uh, two different types of information that FinCEN is going to require. Um, they're working on a database right now. It's not complete, but there's certain fields that they have um, that require certain information. And, you know, we here at Corporate Direct, when we help our clients set up their business, we're going to report this stuff to FinCEN for them. Um, so there's two different types of information that you're going to need to report. The first mm -hmm. type is the reporting company information. So these are the LLCs, the limited partnerships, the corporations, um, you know, all of those. And what's required is the legal name, um, the tax ID number, which is the EIN number that the IRS issues, uh, the county or jurisdiction or state where it's formed. And then also um, a business address, like not a registered agent address, but a physical business address um, where you're conducting business. And then there's also information called the company applicant information. And we here at Corporate Direct, we're going to be the company applicants for people. So we'll report that information on behalf of people. But the second type of information, um, which Stefan asks, is the beneficial ownership information. And this is what we talked about before. Um, if you, the beneficial ownership definition, it's the two prongs. If you meet one of the two, then you're going to have to report that. So the first prong is a beneficial owner, somebody who owns at least 25% of the company. So if you're there or above, um, you're going to have to report your beneficial ownership information to FinCEN. And then the second prong is that you exercise substantial control over the business. So these are the managers and things like that. Um, and if you have, you know, if you own a 10% interest in the company and you're a manager, then you qualify as a beneficial owner and you're still going to have to report that information. Um, and this includes 
The beneficial ownership information, it includes the individual's name. So, you know, first, last, all that. It includes a date of birth. It includes your residential address. And it also includes a photo ID, which is either a passport or a driver's license. So if you're a beneficial owner, you're going to need to report this information in addition to, uh, you know, the reporting company information. And, you know, the expected impact of the disclosure, um, I mean, it's going to be in a government database. I'm not so sure how secure that's going to be. I mean, when they said that they were going to have this database, I believe that that pipeline got hacked like within a week of that. Um, wow. so, you know, the government comes out and says, oh, yeah, this will be completely secure. But um, hackers find a way to hack into these databases. I mean, I don't know how secure they are. So the impact of this disclosure, um, I mean, hopefully it's not hacked, but I, I'm not going to put my faith in that. Um, there, there could be some serious repercussions with this, you know, data rich database that's available for hacking. So, so Michelle, I want to make one point and that is, you know, we'll have some clients that say, no, I am not going to file this report. I want you to set up the LLC, but don't file the information with the government. So the way the act is written is that our company corporate direct, when we file the, your LLC with the state of Wyoming, for example, we have to file with the, with FinCEN. They don't give us a choice. So if you're going to come to us and say, I want to set up an LLC, but don't report, we're going to have to say, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go elsewhere because we, as the company applicant are required to file this information. So anybody out there who says, I'm just going to skirt this, um, you're going to find companies aren't going to be able to help you uh, because they are required by the law to file the information. Yeah. But I'm sure there's attorneys out there that will file. <laughs> that will that will set up your LLC and not file. And that's not following the law. That's not following the law. And then they're also putting them at, at risk for penalties. Yeah. Right. No, it's really surprising how many other services out there aren't going to help their clients with it. I mean, we've called around and said the Corporate Transparency Act takes effect in January. Like, are you going to help people with this? And most of the time they say no. And it's really unfortunate because like they're doing their clients a disservice. Um, you know, they just set up the, the entity with the secretary of state, the LLC, the corporation, whatever. Um, they act as the registered agent, but after that, you're on your own. And when that happens, you're really not that protected. Like you're going to need to have an operating agreement, meeting minutes, all the documentation there. But also you need to report this stuff to FinCEN because like it's a new law that's on the book. And if you don't follow it, like the penalties are really steep. I mean, it's really unfortunate, but. And is it so much per day? Um, how is that 10,000 broken down? Yeah. So it's, um, you, you have 30 days to get this information in. Um, let's say that you were, so before January 1st, it's a year after January 1st, it's 30 days. Once that time period expires, mm -hmm. you can be fined up to $500 each day up until that fine reaches $10,000. So if you, fail if, if you go 10 days over then you're going to have a fine worth five thousand dollars if you go 20 days over you're going to have that ten thousand dollar fine but it stays at ten thousand dollars for every day thereafter so did they throw you in jail after that <laughs> we don't know I mean, they could it, it, the law says that willful failure to file is a two-year prison term uh, if people want to read the law, where can they go find this law at? Well, at Corporate Direct, we have a bunch of articles on it. Um, okay. And you can go online and... and Corporate Direct, y'all. Corporate Direct, if my team can put that in the show notes. Right. And we, we have a, a monthly newsletter. We update you on everything. Because but where is the law actually written? Is, is it the IRS code or where is the law actually... Written. It's in, I believe it's in the U.S. code, but if you type in the Corporate Transparency Act um, and you go online, I believe that the Department of Treasury sort of has the bill right there. 
Um, and if you want to go through it, if you want to go through the weeds, um, I've done it. It's really not that fun. Um, but if you want to do it, you can uh, just head on over. I believe it's the Department of the Treasury has it. But if you just type in the Corporate, of the, the Corporate Transparency Act, um, you know, FinCEN or legislation or whatever, um, it should turn up in the search results. Uh, Michelle, can I mention two little uh, wrinkles to this law? Um, a number of Indian jurisdictions will set up corporations and LLCs. It's not widely known, but you can set up an LLC uh, with an Indian nation. Um, and the law applies to Indian nations as well. So people out there thinking, oh, well, I'll, I'll set up with the Cherokee. And, you know, it, it applies to the Cherokee nation and all other Indian mm. nations. Secondly, a lot of people will set up an entity and, you know, have it in reserve and they don't know who the owners are going to be for 60 days, 90 days. And so mm -hmm. I think now you're going to have to set that entity up much closer to when you know who's going to own what, because you have 30 days to identify the owners. And in a lot of entrepreneurial situations, you may not know that when you when you start. So you're better better off mm -hmm. holding off uh, until you know who are the owners going to be and then file within that 30 day period. Uh, is there any specific thresholds or criteria that businesses need to meet before complying with this act? Yeah. Why don't you tell them about the exception? Yeah. So there are, I mean, the thresholds, like we talked about, if you, mm -hmm. um, set up your business by filing a document with the secretary of state, most likely you're going to have to report that. They do have 23 exceptions in the bill. Um, and, you know, the most prominent one is called the large company exemption. Uh, there's other ones that relate to like entities that are regulated by the, the SEC or insurance companies. So a lot of the exemptions relate to companies that are already regulated by other government bodies. Mm. But the most important exemption that applies to the most number of businesses is called the large operating company exemption. And there's three, and there's three requirements there. The first is that you have $5 million in gross receipts in a given year. Mm -hmm. The second is that you employ 21 or more employees. And the third is that you have a physical operating presence in the U S so you have a brick and mortar location. Um, and so if you meet all three of those requirements, then you don't have to report. Um, but like I said, like if you have a, so then, then will people go back and say, this is another way that big companies get away with stuff like tax deductions, write-offs, things like that. It's interesting. You know, most regulations are geared towards <laughs> the big companies. This one is geared towards the small companies, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're a big company, 5 million isn't that much and 20 employees, um, you know, you don't have to file. However, there's another wrinkle there. Let's say you're starting out and you know, you're going to have 5 million in revenue. You're going to have 20 employees, but you can't prove that the first year right? You're a new business. You can't prove you're going to have 5 million in revenue. So you have to file. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's going to help some companies, but not all. Yeah. And there's a lot of businesses out there that have $5 million in revenue and don't have anywhere close to 20 employees. Right. I mean, most companies are like 10 million and up when they start having a 15, 20, 25, 30 employees. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not going to help a lot of people. Hayden asks, are there any other laws that Congress is interested in passing that would be similar to this act? Not. Yeah. Well, there is one. New York. New York State is looking at having a similar disclosure law that is open for the public to view. So anyone in the country can go to the New York website for the Secretary of State and find out who the owners are, what their addresses are. This is really a bad idea. I mean, entrepreneurs need privacy. You know, you don't need every person knowing exactly what you own. Uh, so, you know, I think if New York state does pass this open disclosure law, you're going to see even more companies leaving that state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we don't need a microscope up our business. Right. Yeah. 
<laughs> Ted thought I was going to say something else. There. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, some states do kind of view it that way, but no, I had, I, I was, there was nothing to add. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous. A lot of entrepreneurs run their business. I understand what they're, the government is trying to do. I think number one, it's more money in their pocket. Number two, get more information on all, on all companies. And number three, yes, you're trying to get the bad guys to behave, but this isn't the way. No, I'm not sure when they look no, back. Because the bad guys are not going to tell the truth. Right. <laughs> and then it even is there even enough manpower to enforce all of this in the government? Good question. You know, they're not asking for any money when you file this. So it's not uh -huh. like it's this self-funding uh, type of mechanism. Uh, so do they have enough employees? I don't know. Mm. No, I mean, it's, it's really an open question how they're going to enforce this. I think for at least the first year, they're going to, you know, cut people some slack in part because they don't have the manpower. Uh, but yeah. you know, year after year, especially when the uh, FBI is able to access this information, and interestingly, your bank can get this information with your permission. And then a local police department uh, with a warrant can get this information. So, you know, the, the, the information that's in this database is going to be used by government agencies quite a bit. And I think you're going to find them arguing to members of Congress, look, this is a useful law enforcement tool. We don't want to give this up. So you're going to have 38 million businesses saying, why do I have to do this? And you're going to have all the law enforcement agencies who are close to Congress saying, we want this. Who wins in that case? <laughs> so what can the business owners do to protect themselves? Well, I, I don't want people to have to pay the fine or go to jail. I think, you know, you're just going to have to, uh, you know, file this form and hope for the best. Um, I, I and now we have all of our data in this database is probably most likely going to get hacked. Uh, probably will. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you asked this last question, how are there any states or local governments that do not want this to pass? And is there anything they can do about it? Well, there are some states like dad mentioned um, that are going to pass uh, similar legislation. The thing is, I don't know if there's any states that can do anything about it. It's federal law. Uh, I mean, law. it's a federal law, so. It's a federal law, so all states have to comply. Yeah, because they have supremacy over the states. But um, there are other states, like we mentioned, like New York, they're going to pass a similar Transparency Act, um, which is open to the public. So it's, you know, even mm -hmm. worse than what You don't even getting. need to hack it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could just go on the New York Secretary of State's website and right. find everything you need. Right. Um, yeah, so other, <laughs> I mean, other states may follow suit. I mean, New York did it. Um, maybe California does it. I, I don't know. I'm just speculating. But uh, but the states are supposed to comply. Yeah. 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 How about Louisiana? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're one of the 50 states. So, yeah, well, they're civil. No, we're not. Yeah. We're all little country you over guys here. Are so yeah. law. You're yeah. the only. We're not a bayou country. We're not part of this federal <laughs> program. The only civil law state there is based on the French system, but you know, it, you're still going to have to yeah. follow it. Lauren asks Can you recommend any resources or organizations that businesses can turn to for guidance or complying with the act? I mean, obviously, you can. You know, reach out to Garrett and Ted's company. Uh, but yes, any other resources here y'all can provide? Well, Corporate Direct is, you know, our company and we're gearing up for it. But as Ted mentioned, we've called around and not many other people are going to be providing this service to their clients. So, you know, other resources certainly uh, look at the law, uh, mm -hmm. understand the law. Uh, but in terms of other resources, we, we just haven't found any. Yeah. And another thing to add on to that is that we're going to have a web page up on our website, on the Corporate Direct website that has a brief rundown of the Corporate Transparency Act. So that'll be up in the coming months. And um, another thing is that I now post stuff on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and type in Corporate Direct, um, you'll see our channel. Please subscribe to it. I post there every week. 
Um, but in the near future, I'm gonna we're going to give you time at the end to put all your plugs, Chad. Exactly. <laughs> all right. We'll Go on. ahead. Yeah. We got that one in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to do some videos on the Corporate Transparency Act. So if you don't want to read anything and you'd rather just watch a video, then um, that's another resource. And that's going to be coming up in the future here, too. Wonderful. So how does, how does this act balance the need for transparency with concerns about data security? I know we've been talking about this, but there is no balance here. That is a really good question. And, you know, the government has just been, you know, they have to present confidence, you know, that we're going to create this database that uh, is not going to be hacked. But as mentioned, the, the week that they announced this, uh, this protective government uh, website, they were hacked in the solar winds hack. There were 16 government agencies that were hacked in the same week they announced this. Uh, it was kind of ironic, but you know, it's, it's just an open question. Can they protect this database? I don't know. What database is really protected? Name one, even on the public sector, name right. one. Hey, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Well, and here's another right, thing, um, Michelle, is the IRS database was hacked. People got information out about, you know, certain political groups and there was no accountability. No one got in trouble. Uh, you know, this was the first time that the IRS was hacked. Uh, they used the information that was hacked for political purposes and no one got in trouble. And a lot of just moderate middle of the road people saw that as a sign that these government agencies are not really caring about protecting this sensitive information. If, if the IRS really cared, they would have gone after these people. They would have found them because the information was used in a political discussion and the IRS never went after these people. And that to me was just telling the American public that we're going to allow certain hacks that we like. Wow. Yeah. You know, the criminals keep getting away with murder and money laundering and everything else. And it's us law abiding citizens that have to pay the piper, pay the government. Right. And so it's, it's terrible. And entrepreneurs are just going to keep saying it's another way that the government's have their money in our pockets. It's another way that they have their eyeballs on our sense of data. Well, but let's right, go so to the extreme. Let's let's look at a kind of a totalitarian system whereby I thought that was extreme. Well, no, go ahead. Go. <laughs> I mean, if you make con campaign contributions to a certain company or a certain campaign, and you are required to list who you contribute money to, uh, in in a future scenario, you could have the government saying, "All right, I want to see what this guy owns." And you're going to have the government go and find out on the database that you own 50% of this company. And, you know, maybe you're, you have uh, a waterway uh, as part of your business. The government mm -hmm. sends out the EPA to harass you about this. So, you know, this could lead to really bad scenarios. Uh, and so we just have to ask, is, you know, how is the government going to use this information? Some business owners might be okay with that ten thousand dollar fine. <laughs> right. Maybe not jail time, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Emily asks, what do you foresee as the potential long-term effects of the Corporate Transparency Act on business and the financial sector? Yeah, well, the long-term effect is that business owners are just gonna lose even more privacy. Um, you know, they they already have to report stuff to the Secretary of State, but this new law just adds an additional burden that they're going to have to comply with. And as we talked about like this, you know, they say this database is secure, but really like, we'll see what happens there. And on top of that, like you're giving more information to the government. So there isn't as much privacy there. Um, another thing is that, like we said, other States could follow suit as well. So you might have to report additional stuff to the secretary of state, for instance, um, and another, thing, yeah, it's a, is you open up Pandora's box here, you know, it's a rabbit hole. Yeah, you, you really do. And I, I think another thing is that criminals are just going to find ways around it. Like dad said, maybe they'll have nominee managers that'll be the beneficial owners in place of them. Um, 
Mm -hmm. And maybe they'll just use unincorporated entities that you don't file with the secretary of state to launder money and do other illegal activities. So yeah, the, the law abiding business owners are going to be the ones who bear the brunt and lose more privacy. It's very unfortunate, but um, I think the long term lose more privacy and may suffer more regulation. Exactly. And pay more fees down the road. Like, it, like I said, it really is opening up Pandora's box and really, you know, scrutinizing these businesses is big brother breathing down your neck. Pretty right. much. Yeah. Right. It could lead to that. Not to be negative here, but where's the positive? <laughs> What's the upside here? Is there any upside, gentlemen? Uh, let's mm. see. Uh, I've tried to think of one. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> government handling people's information. I mean, yeah. yeah I, I don't know. Who trusts the government? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I do government if you're listening. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I mean, bottom line, what's the upside for us? I'm trying to find one, Michelle. I just, I, I can't see one. Yeah. Uh, next time I, well, by the time I have you on my show to talk about asset management, both of you, you'll, you'll have one for me, right? Okay. By then, <laughs> then we'll create. Yeah. One. We'll just, yeah. We'll, we'll make it. Yeah. Out. It just seems like a mess. Um, so maybe it will be determined by who gets in the White House. Yeah. Who knows? You know, when that million million, people you know? realize that they have to do this filing, how many, how many 38 million? million businesses are affected by this law. And when that many business owners realize that they have to file this information at the start mm -hmm. and 30 days after they make a change of their personal address, they have a new driver's license. Uh, you know, they have a new shareholder every, you know, every time that happens, you have to file when that many mm -hmm. Americans realize what's, what this entails you could have an effort uh, to overturn this uh, during a congressional campaign. Uh, I've talked to people who are running for Congress. They've never heard of the Corporate Transparency Act, but I think starting in 24 in the election. Wait a minute. You talk to people in Congress who have never heard of it. Correct. Correct. Wow. I've had to educate two congressmen on it. So the, the politicians don't know. Don't know <laughs> You're going to hear about it come November. Yeah. You know, so the large businesses, 5 million and up 25 employees are exempt from this. It's the small entrepreneurs are going to be really affected by this law. Right. And small entrepreneurs operate on such a low profit margin to begin with that this could be detrimental for a lot of our small businesses, our small entrepreneurs. Yeah. Well, we're going to charge a very affordable fee to, uh, you know, to, to file this for them. Uh, it'll. Yeah. And I wasn't talking about that aspect. I was talking about the aspect of more regulations coming down the pipeline once they have your data and guess what? It's all about putting money in the pocket. It's just like the, look, I love the police officers. Don't get me wrong, but why are we issuing tickets and parking tickets when we could be out there catching murderers, rapists, drug, drug, drug lords, and, um, sex trafficking lords right you know right. why are we worried about speeding tickets parking tickets let's go out there and catch these criminals yep, <laughs> yep. you yep. know it's like this is low hanging fruit um to to line pockets i don't know yeah this it just squeezes the that poor small on and i don't call you poor i'm sorry the the entrepreneurial you know which makes up about 98 percent of those three point thirty eight point million businesses right yeah Right. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people will have, uh, you know, five duplexes in five separate LLCs. They have to report for all five LLCs, you know. Now, what if you are part of, what if you have set up a series LLC? Like you can set those up in Texas, Florida, Nevada, um, Delaware, series LLCs, where, you know, you have one corporation and then all those entities or underneath that one corporation. So you can have Tucker real estate and there's maybe a hundred LLCs underneath that. Well, we're not a fan of series LLC. You know, they're just not tested in court, but let's say you have a series LLC and in series one, you have a group of three owners and in series two, you have different owners. You're going to have to file for each one of those series because it's different ownership. Mm -hmm. So even if it's under the series yep. and you have all these portfolios underneath that series, you still have to do it. Yep. 
because you may have different management, you may have different ownership. Uh, so each series will have to, you know, each you'll have a, a parent series, but each bucket, each series mm. underneath it, in most cases, is going to have to file. Interesting. Now, what happens if so my so I own businesses, um, I invest with partners, investing my money and, and become an equity uh, shareholder with them and grow their company to, to exit rich. So what about like I own a company in my own series LLC and they own a company in their separate LLC. So is our in the in the independent LLCs filing? Or are we just filing for that corporation that we own together? So let's say you have a corporation you own together. You've got to file the, the form. Well, I own it now, but I own it, but not under me personally. I own it under my separate LLC for asset protection. And Garrett, you're slipping know, outside the screen. It's the camera. It's the camera. Just Sorry. Move the camera over. Uh, I need Garrett back no. in the screen. Okay. So um, go ahead. What will happen is that that corporation is going to have to file. And you're going to have to identify that one of the owners of the corporation is an LLC, but they're not going to rely on that. They want to have the next layer of information, which is who owns the LLC. So you're going to have to provide that information. You can So we're going to have to provide my LLC, my partner's LLC, and the actual corporation's LLC. Right. Yeah. They need to know who the, the individual owners are. So you can't hide behind an LLC. Oh, I'm not trying to hide. Know, I'm just saying that's a lot of extra work you, you, and money. You file, <laughs> you file a corporation owned by LLC. Then you have to, for that corporate filing, you have to say LLC is owned by uh, this corporate, this uh, individual. They're getting at the individuals. Gotcha. Okay. I see a final question here with Tib. Um, are there any anticipated challenges or adjustments that businesses should be prepared for. Well, I think we've been talking about most of that on the show. Do you guys have any additional comments, sir? Yeah, I would say um, know the ownership requirements of your business. Because um, with some entities, it can be a little bit hard, especially with like real estate syndications, for instance. Um, you know, there's different ownership percentages there, and sometimes they may fluctuate. So, I think having that down before you file your report is something that businesses should look into. Uh, okay. Yeah. So just having the having everything lined up before you file your report. And with a limited partnership, let's say you're in a syndication and you own five percent, you don't really want to become a manager of that. Uh, you want to have uh, no management control, and that way you don't have to file because you're under twenty five percent and you don't have management control. So in that case, you don't have to file. Mm. And I'm sorry for the camera. We no, got to get yeah, back it's, on the camera. Why is the camera moving? No, it, it, it's this weird, it, it's a new camera. It's nice. It's 4K, but it just kind of adjusts differently. Um, anyway, my, my apologies. So, so. but to, to uh, you know, get ready for the act, just know you're going to have to file unless you qualify for that $5 million uh, exclusion. So it's yeah, um, I mean, or you just if you do have the five million, just go hire a bunch of employees. Um, interns do not count, right? No, independent contractors, time, yeah. independent contractors do not count. No. It's gotta be the W2s, folks. All right. Well, I think is there any last minute before I dive into y'all's books and YouTube channel real quick? Is there any last minute golden nuggets that we have on a law that nobody's talking about? Um, the golden nugget is you need to know about it. No one's talking about it, as you mentioned, and people yep. need to know about it. So it's a good service you're providing your listeners, Michelle, to, to let people know that this is out there. Yep. Agreed. All right. So Garrett, tell us about your new book, Vel, Not Fell, and why is it so important? What year did this book come it out? It came out in uh, 2023. Uh, okay. And so it's just out. And it's about piercing the corporate veil, which is one of the biggest and most overlooked problems of asset protection, whereby okay. you set up the corporation, you want that protection so that someone can't sue you as an owner. And what you do is you set up the corporation and follow the rules. You know, you pay the annual fees, you have a registered agent, you do the minutes every year. And if you follow these simple, simple rules, 
uh, the veil stays strong. If you don't follow these rules, someone can go to court and say, Michelle didn't follow the rules of an LLC. I've got a judgment against her LLC, but she didn't follow the rules. So I'm going to pierce through the veil of protection and get at her personal assets. So we don't wow. want that to happen. And Michelle, it happens in 50% of all cases. Uh, people will, who have a judgment will go to court and, and argue to the judge that they didn't follow the rules here. And so we are entitled to go after their personal assets. Piercing the veil happens in 50% of all cases. So it's important to wow. understand Folks. this book and, and you know follow the rules. 50%, 50%. Oh my goodness. So that's going to be, we're going to talk a lot about that on the next show, asset management. Now that we've wrapped our brains around this law, whether you like it or hate it, which most people are not going to like it, it is what it is. Right. <laughs> and we got, we have to comply. So we'll have them on again to talk about asset management and really dive in to the book, but I encourage everybody to go get the book first. Where can I get the book at? Uh, it's on Amazon. It's at corporatedirect.com. It's, it's pretty much everywhere. We've got it in Kindle, audio, print. Uh, it's pretty accessible. Val, not fail. And some of those things that he just mentioned, I guarantee you, business owners are not doing. I might be guilty of some of those and I know better. Well, and if, if you are, if you, haven't, <laughs> if you haven't done this work, don't tell anyone and we'll clean it up for you. Now, is it too late if you haven't done the work and you've already been sued? You can't unring the bell, can no, you? No, I mean, you can't do certain things. You can't transfer assets once you've been sued. Yeah, you can't put the genie back in the right. bottle. So I get it. I would encourage you to make, uh, you know, take care of this now before there's ever a problem. Gotcha. All right. So we're definitely going to dive into asset management, asset protection, because I will tell you, if 50% are falling into that trap, then 50% are not doing the work to protect their assets. You spend your life building your business and you can lose it like that because we didn't do the work or we didn't hire the experts. More importantly, we didn't hire the experts to help us and do it for us. So Ted, let's talk about you. Um, All right. Let's talk about your book. You're writing a book. I am. Yeah. It's uh I'm going to publish a new ebook that's going to come out later this year. And it's going to be titled the five tricks to teach your kids about money. And the reason I wrote it is because they don't really teach kids about financial education. I mean, they already don't teach parents about it. Um, it's very unfortunate. But and they, they don't really teach it in college either. No, not they, don't teach it, I mean, they don't teach it in the preliminary schools. They don't teach it in a high school. They don't teach it in college. I mean, there's some high profile people whose kids have gotten a lot of trouble with credit card finance. And there's even children that have taken their own lives because they didn't understand finances and they got into a hole that they felt like they couldn't crawl out of. And they were very embarrassed because their parents are extremely successful and they ended up taking their own life. So I'm so happy you're writing this book, Ted. Tell us more. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, it is, Finances are a very sensitive topic. I mean, it's very unfortunate that, you know, like you said, people have killed themselves over financial stuff. It's really, really sad. Um, so yeah, this book, it's, it's titled The Five Tricks, but it's really just sort of five ways to educate your kids um, about money. So uh, one of the chapters is like teaching them a history lesson or have them invest in stocks or setting up a lemonade stand. So it's just different things that you can do to sort of teach your kids in a fun way. Um, you know, it's not like you're using the stick so much, but um, they're just things that parents can do to boost their kids' financial IQ. Um, mm -hmm. so these are things that my parents did with me that other people I know have done with their kids. Um, and it's going to be, it's a quick read. It's probably only going to be like 20 pages when it's said and done. Um, and it's going to be a free ebook and it's going to be available on sunstream.com when it. I told him not to do it for free, folks. <laughs> it's going to be value attached. I think it's his first book. It's so my first we're, one. We're building it on. Okay. Michelle. I'll charge. <laughs> All right, so, don't worry. 
Everybody needs to pick up that book because you're right. They don't teach financial literacy. I know that's um, Sharon Lecter's big thing too is financial literacy. You know, everybody needs to understand it. And there's a lot of adults <laughs> that don't understand financial literacy. And so I think that's powerful. Tell us about your YouTube channel. Yep. So we, I mentioned it before, it's the Corporate Direct YouTube channel. So if you type in Corporate Direct, uh, you'll see it. Please subscribe to it. That would mean a lot to me. Um, well, so and there's one other channel. Uh, Ted mentioned Sunstream, S-U-N-N, -N, uh, stream.com. We're giving away the free ebook there because one of the focuses of this new streaming platform is kids' financial education. We have a number of TV shows that will help kids understand money. Uh, we have gold and silver for kids. We have the history of money for kids. Uh, we have a cartoon show on financial literacy. So if mm -hmm. parents really want to get their kids watching something positive, uh, it's sunstream.com. You can sign up there, but you can also get Ted's free ebook uh, from sunstream.com. We haven't launched yet, but we're going to be launching in the next few weeks. So uh, be sure and look at We'll make sure we include that in the show notes yeah. too. And right. my ebook will be ready by the end of the year. Um, you know, the illustrations are still coming along, but once it's done, we'll have it up on sunstream.com. That's awesome. And I think it's easier to teach financial literacy today than it was back, you know, decades ago. Uh, probably Garrett, when, even when you grow up, um, because there's so many ways, like now you have the internet, now you have all this e-commerce business, they can take their old shoes or old toys or clothes or whatever and stick them on eBay, <laughs> you know, stick them on Craigslist, stick them on Amazon. Yeah. So I think it's much easier now than it used to be. I, hey, do a paper route, you know? I agree. I mean, my parents did not talk about money. It was just something that parents didn't talk to kids about. And we had three TV channels and, you know, they didn't, they didn't have money shows on there. So you're right, but we just need to make it accessible for kids. We need to make it fun. And, you know, Ted's book on the, um, you know, tricks and strategies, you know, when you say, when he says start a, a, a stock brokerage account, you do that with imaginary money. You don't have to set up the account. Uh, you know, you can just do it without money. And well, I mean, that's what they do in school and college, right? They set it up with imaginary right, money, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, Ted, talk to us about Corporate Direct. Anything else on that? Yeah, so um, the YouTube channel that we have, um, I started a series there called Direct Answers from Corporate Direct. And the whole idea is that people can post general questions. I stay away from the specifics because that can border on legal advice. Don't want to, you know, get into trouble there. Um, but yeah. Well, you are an attorney. <laughs> I am, but um, for legal advice, there's a different way to get the answer for that. Um but yeah, so if anyone has any general questions about, you know, corporate law, the business world, finance, real estate, whatever, you know, anything that we help people with, they can leave a comment on one of our videos and eventually I'll get around to answering it for them. Uh, I guess he says eventually. Yeah. <laughs> so he's under, he's going to under promise and over deliver. <laughs> yep. Pretty much. All That's right. kind of the goal. But, um, no, it's a cool, it's a cool resource. Um, I post videos every week. Uh, we have a guy who comes in, does the videos, edits them, does a really good job. Um, so if you want to use that as a resource, I'd really appreciate it. Just head on over to Corporate Direct's YouTube channel, subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions about anything, feel free to leave a comment. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for being on. Any last minute comments? No, thank you, Michelle. I mean, this is great that you're educating your listeners on this new law that no one's talking about. So I try to keep my listeners in business. Yeah. So I can help them exit rich. Right. I can't help them exit rich when they go out of business. Well, or they're in jail. <laughs> <laughs> or in jail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this has been brilliant, brilliant information. So I'm so grateful for you too for really sharing what nobody's talking about this new law is corporate transparency law. So everybody, look, thank you so much for joining another episode of Exit Rich. I know you found it as valuable as I did. And it's it's extremely important. And it really boggles my mind why nobody's talking about it. Because it sounds like nobody knows about it, even politicians, which is really, really scary. 
So I know you love this episode. I know this is great value for you. Please share this with all of your entrepreneurial friends. Share this with your entrepreneurial network. Anybody that you know that's in business or starting a business, please get the message out and please subscribe to Exit Rich Podcast. Thank you again for joining us for another episode. Thank you to my wonderful guest. Until next Wednesday, we'll see you again for another episode of Exit Rich. Have a wonderful, productive day. Thanks for listening to the Exit Rich Podcast. Don't forget to check out Michelle Seiler Tucker's Build to Sell Blueprint books and Exit Rich, along with more blogs, videos, and resources at ExitRichPodcast.com. Be sure to connect with Michelle on Facebook or LinkedIn and stay tuned for her next episode by subscribing in your favorite podcast player.